What up, everybody? It's a special edition of Off The Grid. I am here in Las Vegas, and I get a chance to interview my big brother. I'm talking about the Hall of Famer, Brian Young. Enjoy the episode, everybody. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's your man, Spice Adams. This is Off The Grid. I am here with my big brother. He is... Uh, he got 14 years in, all with the 49ers. Uh, rookie of the year, defensive rookie of the year, comeback player of the year, four-time pro bowler. Uh, this is just off the top of my head. Uh, and Hall of Famer from Chicago Heights, Notre Dame, Brian Young. <sighs> <laughs> this is uh, such a different light to see you in. Uh, no, it's not. Well, you, you, Mr. Funny Guy. Like, <laughs> Come on, man! Like, what did what like, you think of me my rookie year? Man, I'm like, uh, who's this kid? This dude was, he was stout. He, uh, from a personality standpoint, I thought you were, your, you had a great personality, uh, just infectious, um, always laughing, um, always joking, but but not initially. Like I thought, I thought you you tried to understand the temperament of the locker room yeah. before you. You know, just became double A. Yeah, um, yeah, it was it was a gradual process, but when all double A was out, man, it was hilarious. <laughs> all right, my I can tell you, man, it, the, some of the funniest moments in practice I ever had, and I was a I was a serious like pre-practice dude. Like yeah. I didn't smile and joke or anything, but when this dude came, <laughs> listen, our our pre um, pre-practice warm up was comedy hour. <laughs> and uh, I just remember being in stitches. I'm like, this dude is seriously funny. Dude, we had some fun. Like man. you, like he never, like nothing was off limits. <laughs> <laughs> no, and nobody was off limits. Yeah. Strength coach, coach, you oh, know, we had a good guys time, in the dude. locker room. We had a great time. We and I think that's time. what it's all about, you know. Yep. Just having fun in the locker room. Football is hard as it, hard as it is, and um, you know, to, to have some light and some laughter is always good. Tell me how I was, you know, growing up in Chicago Heights, man. Like, I I understand, like, your love for Chicago now that I've been living there. And I was like, man, I see why B.Y. is, like, so excited when he come on. I remember we played the Bears, and you had to get all them tickets. I was like, God, <laughs> I met your whole family. Was, we were deep. Yeah, deep. <laughs> Uh, big fun, big fun yeah, was big there. Fun. Yeah, <laughs> shout out to big fun. Big fun. <laughs> yeah. What was Chicago like growing up? You know, it was great. Uh, it, you know, Chicago Heights is a blue collar town. Um, it used to be a very thriving uh, steel mill was kind of the uh, occupation at the time, mm -hmm. um, and until the steel mills closed down, and then, but there was still you know um, opportunity otherwhere. My dad. Other places, my dad worked at Ford uh, Motor Company, and um, you know, um, it, it it was there was trouble as well. If you were looking for trouble mm -hmm. to get into, and you know, lucky for me, I had a a mom and a dad that that you know that instilled that were, would discipline us if we got out of line, mm -hmm. um, and kept us away from you know making those poor choices and and not hanging out with the wrong people. But um, I had a lot, I got a lot of family there on the south side and west side, and um, had a great time growing up. I got two older brothers and no sisters, and uh, being the youngest always got picked on a little bit mm -hmm. and got left behind. Um, and, you know, we had a good time too. You know, so many kids in our neighborhood, our street alone was just, you can go next door, you can go two houses down, and. A lot of my friends lived on the same street, and um, you know you can go down and play tag football in the streets, or go play tackle football in the park. Did you always know you was gonna play football? I didn't. No, no I didn't. Um, you know, like I said, we used to play tag football in the streets, and then in the winter time or sometime in the summer, we would go to the park and play on the grass, tackle football. And it was serious business too. Like I bet I remember in middle school we would like pad up, not like pads, but like layer up in clothing. Uh -huh. And so we go to the park and it was live action. It's like <laughs> it was it, going that, down. Oh yeah, like it was tackle football. Guys were clotheslining dudes with no pads on. 
<laughs> like it was serious business. And if you could survive that, man, you were a tough kid in the neighborhood. You got respect. Yeah. Um, but I didn't know. I didn't play Pop Warren or anything like that. I didn't start playing football until my freshman year of high school. Me too. Yeah, so. I was too big. And didn't know what position I would play. I thought, you know, I would be a, a fullback. You know, at the time, Matt Suey was the fullback for the Bears and Tom Rathman you know, mm -hmm. was a fullback for the 49ers. And those are my two teams growing up. And really? Uh, yeah. The Niners were? Yeah, they, the Niners became my team watching the Bears beat up on them, and then the 49ers returning the favor in the playoffs. And so uh, I, I'm like, who is this Jerry Rice guy in Joe Montana? <laughs> so that's how I began to like the Niners growing up. But oh, uh, but I thought I was going to play fullback. Really? Yeah. And my friends in the neighborhood kept encouraging me. It was like, uh, man, I think you should be a fullback. No, you should be oh, a linebacker. hyping you up. So my first, very first day out at practice in the summer, we had these name tags on our helmets, uh, Tate Young. And um, so coach brought out the whole team up and he started telling us about, you know, what we're going to do, how practice is going to go, mm -hmm. and then where he wanted the different positions to go when he blew the whistle. And so he was like, brruh, brruh. everybody were going, the D line was going over here, the running backs were going over there and the linebackers over here, and I started to go with the running backs. <laughs> and my coach, Coach Piazza said, mm -mm. Mm -mm. Young, over here. <laughs> so I never got my shot at fullback. But you you probably started out at probably like 220 maybe, 215. No, I was like around 170-ish, 80, what? 180, 185. Yep, because I wrestled 185 my, my oh, freshman year. What? I would have yeah. never guessed that. I was man. a pencil neck. What? Yeah. I mean, one, 185 <laughs> at, at that time, I mean – 185 is not a small guy, but. 185, I was in elementary school. No question. Mm. Probably fourth grade. Okay. 185. No, nah, I would have never guessed that, man. Not freshman year. 185. You, you, you wrestled your I whole wrestled. four years? I did. I started actually my uh, in junior high school because my brothers wrestled in high school. So I would, in eighth grade, go up to the high school and kind of wrestle around with them. And uh, that's how it kind of got started. Mm -hmm. But officially, I didn't wrestle to my freshman year of high school. It was at 185. So they 185 freshman year, then thereafter it was heavyweight. Mm -hmm. Did you always know you uh, wanted to go to Notre Dame? or? Um, no, it wasn't always set in stone. Um, you know, at the time, I had a really good friend whose brother went to Michigan, uh, Derek Walker. Marcus Walker is my friend. We went to high school together. And Derek Walker uh, went to Michigan, played tight end in the NFL with the Chargers in Kansas City. And so um, and he, he would always talk about, you know, Michigan, Michigan this, Michigan that. And so for a while I was really sold on Michigan because it was like the most popular thing. But also I did take an eighth grade trip on the way back from D.C. to Notre Dame's campus in the eighth grade. Mm -hmm. And I was like mesmerized by that. Yeah. And But even having taken that trip and then having seen things come full circle in the recruiting process, I thought Notre Dame was the best fit for me. Yeah, and then you get drafted by the Niners. Seventh, seventh pick. Seventh pick in the first round. Mm. What was that like? Like, did you go to the draft? Did you go to New York? I didn't. I turned it down. Do you wish you would have went? No, no. I, I, I think I, I made the right decision then, because I just did. I didn't. You know, I was pre-draft speculation. You have all these mock draft people were evaluated me as a top 10 to 15 pick and mm -hmm. I just wasn't buying it um I didn't want to be that guy and, and then be on the front stage and watching everybody uh, yeah. see <laughs> all of my emotions of yeah, yeah, yeah. this happening and you don't get picked I was like you know I want to be at home with my family yeah and so that was the best thing you know in place for me to be mm -hmm. did you uh you had your suit and that, all that stuff when you got there like because I was I was at Penn State and I had all my workout gear with me. Mm. And um, they wanted to fly me in. And then we had a press conference like that next day. And I was like, man, I, I don't have anything. I don't have a suit or nothing. So when I got drafted, it was like, it was probably like 7 p.m. And the mall was about to close. So I'm like, we all like, yeah, man, we going mm -hmm. to the Niners, da, da, da. And then they like, dude, you got a flight at like 6 a.m. Like uh, my cousin was like, 
you need a suit, bro. It's gonna be a press conference. I was like, oh yeah. So we go to the mall, like right. End up getting there like right before it closed, and I got like some Dockers, and then I took my uh, coach's uh, suit jacket. It was all pieced together, man. I got like a tie from. I don't even know. It's probably like a grocery store or something like that. I had on like some. Remember the Dr. Martin shoes? I had. It was. It was so bad, dude. You know, it's funny you mentioned that. I had a hand-me-down suit that I think, honestly, that Jerome Bettis had worn before. We used to wear a coat and tie for game day mm -hmm. at Notre Dame. And so uh, when he left, he was like, "Here, I'll need this. Somebody else can wear it." So I, I, I acquired it. And uh, it was the suit that I wore to my press conference when I got drafted. <laughs> oh, so we had fun. We got a chance to, uh, um, you know, enjoy family, some food. And uh, the very next day was an early flight out. And so I wore that suit that Jerome Bettis gave me. That's crazy, man. Did, did you know, like, first practice or a couple of practices in, were you like, all right, I, I think I belong here. Like, I think I can make some noise. Um, the the first mini camp we go out, so it's the the first mini camp, or like a week after the draft or something like that. They used mm -hmm. to do it a lot different then, and so I go out there. We go Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and it's shorts, no pads, and I'm like just running around, you know, doing what I do. But it's like uh, it's kind of a false sense of security, you know, because you're not in pads. But I remember this one particular, the speed of the game was absolutely different. Mm -hmm. I'm like, man, whew, wow, like this is fast. But the last day on Sunday, um, all the veteran guys, you know, they don't practice as much. And so this is the rookie's first time being a part of the team. Yeah. And they left me in for like 13 reps straight. <laughs> it was like the last team period. And I remember Steve Wallace, who played our left tackle, and I was kind of playing the right three technique. <clears throat> and every now and then he had to block down on me or pass protect or whatever, put a hand out in the B gap. And he said at the end of practice, he said, hey, young fella, he said, you're going to be all right. <laughs> I was like, man, that meant a lot. Yeah. Like, that really did. So that was very encouraging to hear. But when I got to training camp is when I felt like, okay, I I think I could. I'm gonna be all right this so year. Your OGs was it? Was Haley there? Charles Haley wasn't. So my OGs were Richard Dent, okay, Hall of Famer. Mm -hmm. Ricky Jackson, Hall of Famer. Had Tim Harris, who had been in the league for a while. Yeah, some dogs. Uh, Dana Stubblefield was in his second some year. Dogs. Uh, Dennis Brown, who was a, a really good player. I think he was in, in his sixth or seventh year, and. Um, I'm missing some guy, uh, Charles Mann, a uh, long, long time uh, Redskins defensive end who had a vicious club. Um, so I had those guys in my room, yeah. and I had a wealth of knowledge. Do and you so, remember this, man? I think it was uh, – it might have been OTAs, but I, I can't remember. It was um, as soon as we step out the door. Pew! Like this was like my first practice, and I think you was, I think you was messing with me. <laughs> You sprinted so fast. It was you and Andre Carter. I'll never forget this. Y'all sprinted over to the drills, and I'm like, oh. So I'm, like, trying to keep up with y'all, and I'm just like, there's no way. Like, like you you are at least 10 yards, like, ahead of me, and I'm like, I'm not going to catch these guys. And then, like, DQ just blew the whistle, and y'all went straight to the, the ladders, just going, bam, bam, bam. Like, let's go, chop, 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 chop. And I'm like, eh. I'm like, I'm driving. I'm going as fast as I can. And they're like, faster, fast, go, 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 go. And then, like, we must have went through all the individual drills in, like, probably 45 seconds. <laughs> do, you, do you remember doing that? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. I did that on purpose. I know you I, did. I wanted to pick up the pace. It was my introduction. <laughs> well, you, I, you got me. Yeah, it was my intro was to the rookies to say, hey, welcome <laughs> to the NFL. This is only a shorts practice, but I, want, I was, I was uh, purposely – uh, picking the pace up so you can get tired. I want, I want to was, see you. This was like, I got there 2003. This was probably like year nine for you at that point. Mm -hmm. Like, and you were still like, it looked like a, a good 4'7", 4'8". You know what I was most. really trying to do? I was trying to see you take a knee 
not you specifically, but yes, you, all the rookies that that their first time they're going through the bags. Oh, I want to go do that. And um, I wanted to see them bend over. I think I got you. Well, yeah, I would definitely do that. <laughs> like that's <laughs> my stamina. It's like it's it's straight, but eh, some things, man, I just gotta. <sighs> Yeah. yeah, that was yeah. You got me though, man. That was that was but that was. You that was know what? Good. You survived. It didn't take long before you got it. <laughs> chop chop. Oh man, that was dog. So, when did you break your leg? Like, what year was it? Was that ninety nine? That was nineteen ninety eight. Ninety eight. I was in my fifth season. Um, off to a really good start that season. I think at the time I was. It like, was it was nasty to yeah. watch, man. I know Listen, it was it crazy was, it, going it, through it. It was nasty to watch, and the, but it was even worse feeling the going through the pain. Mm -hmm. And um, so that happened like week thirteen, the twelfth game of the season, and just a a fluke play. You know, the quarterback saw me coming. He hitched up in the pocket, then he scrambled, and then the linebackers were converging out of coverage, and. Um, I saw the quarterback sliding, and I go to pull up. I plant my leg in the ground, and then a teammate ran right into it, and I uh, just saw it snap. It was it was really shocking in the sense that I'm like, man, this just really happened. Yeah. Like I can't believe it. Then it's like, man, you see things happen like that to peep to players in the game, but never would you I think it was going to happen to you, happen to me, or to anybody, and. Um, but it didn't feel good. Did you like? I mean, you got it. It's a steel rod in mm -hmm. your leg, mm -hmm. and it's just, it's just there, like, like this. This, yeah. This was in your leg. Yeah, more like this. <laughs> right. Oops, I hit the mic. So you like TSA? You just yeah. When they first, <coughs> right after nine eleven, when they heightened security up. Like they do the one or just the, you know, detector, metal detector, it would go off and I would have to tell them, you know, I got, I got metal in my leg. That's a the steel rod in the leg, dog. Like that's, I mean, you had to think like, man, am I gonna be able to play anymore? Like, uh, like that's just. That was a the a huge, um, thought. You know, throughout my rehab, I just. I knew I was still young in my career, and there was a lot of hope, and I remained hopeful through the process. But there were days where I just didn't think it was going to ever happen because the healing was very slow, and there I would hit a plateau, mm -hmm. and then it was like, man. Then I would see a little bit of progress, and that was the glimmer of light that gave me hope um, to keep pushing and to yeah. keep moving forward. And um, it took a lot, you know, a lot went into that uh, rehab in the off season. You know, I didn't, I didn't practice until that first week in the regular season. Yeah. There was no mini camps. Um, it was no uh, training camp. Um, in fact, I couldn't even, at times, I couldn't do two back-to-back -back heart workouts together because my leg was still healing, it would swell. Mm -hmm. So I had to rest it and then go back, you know, a day the next day or, or the day after. Um, so it was a long process. Yeah, then you got comeback player of the year. You know what I mean? So it's like you, but I mean, it's you. You know <laughs> what I'm saying? Like, I, I get it, but it's like, if 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 anybody can do it, it's like it's by like I, I well, see I, dog. I seen you hurt your shoulder, <laughs> and then get on the uh, incline with like three sixty five, and it was like that's by. You know what I'm saying? Listen, um, I, I think just it it really challenged me in a in a lot of different ways. You know, I, I threw I, I thought I knew a lot about myself like my love for the game. But it was also a challenge to me, like what are you willing to do for something that you love so so much? Mm -hmm. And so to be able to push through that and and challenge myself to get back on the field, um, it was the feat, it was the, the challenge that I accepted. Yeah, that's, that's dope, man. Like you gotta, 
You got to drive like I never seen. You know when I knew you were gonna go to the Hall of Fame, it was it was just the practices, man. It was just like I remember, <laughs> like you get two reps in one on ones, and if you lose that first rep, <laughs> it's like had to run them back. Get your popcorn ready. Like I yeah, said, I, hey, I couldn't and leave. And then it. you know the old lineman, they'll be like, here come the bull, here come the bull rush. Sure enough, here come the bull, but you can't you can't stop it. Like you had a. You just had like something in you, or just like you won't block me unless I allow you to. Like it was just like it was it was cool to see, and then you would try to teach me different stuff, and I try to do it like you, and I'd just be like, I, <laughs> I can't do it that way. Um, you know, I, I was a big believer, and and I learned this in, in college too. Just you know, I thought I had a great work ethic, but then watching an, an upperclassman, Devon McDonald. Mm-hmm. Uh, just run to the ball relentlessly in practice, yeah. and um, and so that was that was a way he kept himself in shape and his endurance. So when he got in games, you know um, he never would get tired, and he didn't have to do extra running after practice because it was it was whistled to all the way competing down the field on on different plays in practice. When I got to the Niners, then it was like I got to go to another level. Mm-hmm. I saw a guy in Jerry Rice and his work ethic, how he would. Did take you ever a, do the hills with him? I never did. I never did the hills. Mm-hmm. I wanted to, but I never did. Um, but watching him, just how he practiced, it was every rep was a game day rep. And so he would take those consistently. So I was like, okay, this, this is the standard. Mm-hmm. So I had to elevate my, even more, my practice habits even more. Yeah. And, um, you know, 14 years, one team, that's just like, that's that's rare, you know? So um, that's that's dope that, you know, the Niners and you, you know, took it upon yourself to say, hey, look, I'm here, I don't wanna go nowhere else. And, you know, you were always just a, a great role model. And I remember doing a uh, couple's Bible studies and just going over to the couple's Bible studies by myself, mm. just so I could see, you know, what the, what marriage is like, yeah. like, how to back and forth go and how, um, you know, just how to navigate being a professional, mm-hmm. like out on the field, but then coming home and still being, you know, the man of the house and everything. And yeah. you set a good example, man. Like y'all, like just the, just the whole vibe of the Niners at the time in 2003 was just so like, so professional, man, and just so like I, I needed that. Yeah, I needed to see that that you know it wasn't all about just partying and being flashy right. and stuff like well, that. Like, thank you, man. I appreciate you saying that. Yeah, man. And even then, we were you know we were still a work in progress, and uh, but I thought it was important, like having the ability to impact other players and, and guys um, was important to me. That was part of our ministry. And so, but but more so that you, I was really excited that you would make the effort to come over as a single guy. You were the only single dude there, mm-hmm. and that was that was pretty cool. And I used uh, to bring the banana pudding. And yeah, you'd bring the banana pudding, and then you would <laughs> eat about three thirds of it, which is all Before of it. Before it got there. <laughs> Yeah, man, that was some good times, man. Gosh, man, I wish I could, like, go back. Like, okay, what is some advice you would tell, like, the younger B.Y., like, 22-year-old B.Y.? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I would tell the younger B.Y. that it's okay to be vulnerable. And and uh, most times that most times in my earlier earlier in my career in life, I would I would just be guarded. I was really really guarded and wouldn't allow people to uh, know me. Um, and so I had to learn how to how to take the walls down and, and mm-hmm. grow. And, and matured, especially uh, when I started to take my walk with Christ very serious. And so I had to learn how to uh, open up and mm-hmm. talk about the hard things, the things that, that challenge you in life, that keeps you up at night. And um, when, I, when, I, when I think about that, that's what I would 
advise the young BY is to open up. Mm-hmm. You know, we're not perfect. Um, be vulnerable and uh, learn from your mistakes. When did you uh, When did you meet your wife? When did you meet Kristen? Kristen, man, I'm telling you, man. she's my better whole, not better half. <laughs> when did When did y'all meet? Y'all meet at Notre Dame? We did uh, freshman year. Yeah, we we're the same <laughs> class. You thought you had game. Uh, you know, I was all right. He was all right. She felt sorry for you. A little bit. <laughs> a little bit. You know, she was like, this dude needs a little work. So she, I was her project. She took me under her wing. <laughs> <laughs> now, we met our freshman year at Graffiti Dance. And, uh, what is it? This is during freshman orientation. All the freshmen would wear white T-shirts. Mm-hmm. And so you would go around meeting other freshmen. And at the time, we had a... It was a seven-digit number, but the last four digits of the number, um, you could call from room to room. And so I remember seeing her that night at the graffiti dance with girls from her dorm, and I spotted her. I'm like, in my mind, I'm thinking, like, man, she's beautiful. Like, she, man, that's gonna be my wife one day. And we, I got, we were friends our freshman year, um, but we didn't start dating until our sophomore year. I was kind of seeing somebody, uh, she was as well. And then right at the end of freshman year, she was going back to Chicago. Her parents were from Chicago. She was going to her grandparents' house. And I was packing up as well, and I saw her walking by my dorm. And I said, hey, what, hey, Kristen, I yelled out. And we small talk. She said, I'm going to Chicago. We exchanged numbers. And once she got in town, um, we connected. I went over to her parents, uh, gr- her grandma's house, that Both early? grandmas, yeah, Sheesh. yeah, but we were already serious. friends, so we had we had some, you know, we weren't like strangers, so we had some. Oh, okay. Spent some time together, just as friends, mm-hmm. and uh, but from that day forward, the last day of school was when we really started to kind of stay in touch, and mm-hmm. then we did over the summer, and then sophomore year we came back to school. Um, that first week back, I asked her to be my girlfriend. Yeah. Mm, okay. And you you did it like you thought it was smooth, like how you did it. Yeah, it was smooth. Like it was some. It was some. Gang. If, if I asked Kristen, would she say it, it was smooth? Yeah. One hundred. One hundred. <laughs> okay. You uh, break your leg. You got a steel rod in your leg. And did you think like at this point in time? You probably had been in the league, you said five years already. So did you think like, all right, I'm gonna get another five in and then I'm gonna just. My goal was to get 10 years, at least 10 years. I <laughs> uh, wanted to get double digits. And anything after that was icing on the, was extra and icing on the cake. Um, and so that, that was my goal to get 10 and to see where I was at that time. Mm-hmm. But at five, I was like, man, this, this is going to change dramatically. And then I came back from the injury. I got 10, and then each year was an assessment. And I wanted to make sure that that my level of respect for the game was always the same, that my mindset was right, that I took care of my body and I was okay physically to play another season. But more importantly, um, I wanted to stay with the same organization as well. And the Niners always you know, opened the door for that to happen, and I wanted to be there. So um, I, it was a blessing. And did I you did you go out the way you wanted to? Like, cause you, you know, like I had one year left on my deal to yeah. get to ten, and I was like, and I didn't want to go out like that, but you know, I didn't have a choice. Well, I didn't I didn't go out in the way that I wanted to, and the ideal way I wanted to go out to go out was to win a Super Bowl. Right. And and <laughs> or to go out on a winning season, mm-hmm. and uh, that obviously. Didn't happen, you know, we were still kind of in that rebuilding mode uh, toward the end of my career. Um, but I, but I, I would like to say that, you know, it was important for me to, to exhaust everything that I had gained over the years of the course of my career that people gave to me. I wanted to make sure that I, that I did that for other guys in that locker room. What was the struggle like when you were done? Because I, I struggle. Yeah, time, man. that's a great question. I think that's where. I mean, 
it's it's something that needs to be talked about, man, because a lot of people think, like, oh, retire, and I'm going to just go straight into this and that. But it's like we've been doing this for a long time, yeah. man. And then when you give it up, you don't have that crowd that's yelling for you. You don't have that set schedule where it's like, all right, I got to be here by 8 to get the meetings and all this stuff. Yeah. Now it's just like you completely on your own. And mm-hmm. it's just – it's a, it was a struggle for me, and I know it was a struggle for anybody else to just – just halt like just done yeah that's a great question I you know toward the end of my career you know each year after 10 it was an assessment and I knew I was nearing the end and so about year 12 I started this two-year process and I hired this this guy Ray Rude was his name um Ray Rude Ray Hood um but he was a kind of an executive coach um consultant and we would meet periodically um, over time. And basically he was learning like, and helping me understand the things that I was good at, things I weren't, weren't good at, strengths, weaknesses, interests, um, and also talking to other people, what they thought of me from a you know, strength and weakness standpoint, a personality standpoint. And then things that um, I thought was of interest to me that I wanted to do. Um, and then my temperament for those things. So it was a, it was this personality test that was like a two-year process. But at the end of it, um, at year 14, I knew what I, I had a, a really um, finite idea of what I wanted to do. And it was really three things. It was coaching, which everybody thought I would never do. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, it was ministry in some shape, form, or fashion. And then I like real estate and just anything around real estate. So um, there was some thought into that as well. And so when I did retire, um, I decided to coach and give it a shot. Uh, did you that. just went straight into it? I, well, not – so 2008 I retired. I kind of took that whole off season. Yeah. And we basically RV'd around the whole country. Um, bought an RV uh, at, the, at the time. I remember we that. Four kids. I remember that. Homeschooling. Mm-hmm. And we took the show on the road um, from July was a small trip. Part of August, I came back and was kind of exploring around the building a little bit, mm-hmm. um, asking questions. And then we set sail basically in August, and then September, and then October for like three and a half months. We're on the road for like 20,000 miles. And it was a great transition for me because um, I was away from football and I couldn't watch the games like I wanted to. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was just us and the family and just mm-hmm. seeing the country and educating our kids. And um, and then at the end of that, in October, it was like, you know, November, December. And then it was like putting a list of people together and places that I thought I would maybe go and try coaching. And Notre Dame gave me a shot. So I went there in February and was a graduate assistant. Yeah, And so... The season didn't go well, but the experience was was good and enough to want to come back another year and do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, transition is really hard, um, and not everybody does it well or know what they want to do when they retire. But it's really no surprise to me that you're doing what you're doing, and I am extremely proud of you because you have found your niche. You are absolutely living in – your destiny, like you're having fun, you impact people, you make people laugh, and uh, you got a gift at it, man. And um, I'm excited for you and and what you're doing. Um, and and quite frankly, I I smile all the time when people say, "Man, that Spice Adams is so funny." I'm like, "That's my dude. Like I know him. Like he used oh, to do this. Devil A. He used to do the same thing in practice, and uh, I knew he was gonna be that guy." Um, but man, I'm I'm excited for you and just where your career is. You have landed um, where you're supposed to be post career wise. And uh, if there's a, a blueprint on how to do it, it is following your passion. And Double A Spice Adams is the template and an example of that. Now the the, the tough question, and you know I didn't, you know I, I I'm I'm not very good with this type of stuff and. You know, um, just the the loss of Kobe, your son, Kobe Young. Uh, 
I mean, how how was that to 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 deal with like the process of that? Like because you know, it's somebody gonna be here watching this, mm -hmm. and they're gonna say, "Well, I, I know By dealt with it this way," you know. So, how did you like? I, I don't even know how to formulate the question mm -hmm. of that, man, yeah. because it's just like I can't wrap my head around, you know, just a just a loss like that. Yeah, man, you it, know, you know, it, it it's um, when you think about family being a father, being a husband first, and then a father, and you think about leaderships, uh, and still the morals and values in your kids, and being the protector. Um, the, 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 that one part, being the protector, impacted me, because um, when Kobe was diagnosed with a brain tumor, um, I couldn't protect him, and there was nothing that I could do to protect him as a father, <clears throat> and um, that, that really, challenged me and it hurt me yeah and um you know having gone through a diagnosis and then surgery gone through treatment um and then he relapsed and then a little bit more treatment and then the disease just um invaded his body and you know he succumbed to cancer it was a little bit over a two-year process and um it was hard man it was it was really challenging it challenged my faith yeah. you know i think if I hadn't been grounded in the word and knowing who my Lord and Savior was, um, it would have been even tougher. Um, even with Christ, there were some really, really dark, dark moments and, and times. And But I would always just, you know, continue to just grab on to what I could. And, and, and God gave me enough. He gave me enough. Um, he comforted me in, in some of the hardest times. Um, it was a challenge. Um, even as, as, you know, being a protector, you know, you 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 realize how much of your life that you can't control. Like there's so much that you can control, but then there's certain, certain things that you just can't control. And so, um, in those moments, God, God was enough for, for me and for our family. What, what's it like, you know, always having the right thing to say? Cause I, I promise I call you every now and again. Or I text you every now and again, and you just—I don't know what it is, man. You just always had the right thing to say. Well, I don't. Know. Yeah, that's. I don't know if that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> I just. And, well, and, for me, I'm just and, and talking about for me. Yeah, me saying it to you. Um, you know. Um, I mean. Is that a question to me, or you're saying that I have? I what always, is it like? I don't. I don't have, know. What me it's having like, always when I tell people stuff, it'd be the wrong stuff. <laughs> Listen, I've been wrong <laughs> plenty of times. Not, not with not with me. Um, not with me. You, you know, the biggest thing too, man, is is, and I'm learning this still, is that um, I just I'm trying to be a really good listener, and just understand where people are before I give an answer or advice, sometimes people don't want advice and, mm -hmm. and sometimes, you know, they do. And so when, when I feel like people don't want advice, they just need an ear and they just want to vent and let, and have someone listen to them. And, um, you know, sometimes that's, the, that's the best advice too, is mm -hmm. being a great listener. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, just just listen, and and knowing when to interject, and not say something crazy off the hoof, off mm -hmm. the cuff, and just being wise. You know, what would I do in the, in those situations? Um, I'm still learning though. Mm -hmm. How do you? Here's a here's a good question. How do you? How are you able to reach all of your kids? like where they are, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Like, cause I can't, I got four kids and I can't, um, you know, I can't like teach Anthony the same way that I do with Amina. Like mm -hmm. I gotta, like, I can't do the same things. So how do you do that with all of your kids? Learning your kids and you learn your kids when you spend time with them. Mm -hmm. Um, watch them from afar, uh, interact with them, 
kids will tell you a lot. And then when you do say things, how do they respond to those things? How do they respond to constructive criticism or discipline? Uh, how do they respond to encouragement? And um, how do they respond when things get tough in their own life with you know schoolwork or them playing a sport or the, their siblings are having a, a confrontation or a conflict and how do they interact? And so just being able to learn each of our kids and, and knowing what motivates them, what encourages them, what inspires them. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a process, you know. Each kid is different. Their personalities are so different. And, and just learning how each kid operates because you, you can't parent the, the same. Yeah. Because when you think about, you know, the same – somebody comes off successful, then, you know, you now there's another sibling that – makes bad choices in life, but they are not the same household. Um, that's because, you know, everybody can't be parented the same. You can. There are certain principles that you you abide by, but it is also learning each kid and mm-hmm. knowing how to interact with each kid. Yeah. Did you um, did you have aspirations of being a Hall of Famer, or were you just like, I'm just going to ball out and just – did you, like, I think I'm close, like – you know, there, there was a prediction. I, I can't remember. Um, I think it was the Chicago Sun Times. There was this writer who was predicting like what would the future hold for each high school athlete, uh, football player, and I think I saw like somebody like predicted me to be a uh, a Pro Bowl type player or a future Hall of Famer. Mm. I was like, oh man, what is that? Like future <laughs> Hall of Famer? I was like, okay. So my career goes, and I don't think about it. I'm just playing. My head's down. I'm just doing the work. I'm taking care of what's important now. Mm -hmm. And I'm not really thinking about, uh, like, legacy. I'm just laying it down, like, trying to do the very best I can in that present moment. And so when I finally look up, I'm like, wow, okay, people are saying this and that. Um, And you hear talk about it, and it becomes exciting to to hear that you're – you're mentioned among some of the greatest in the game. Yeah. And you just never know if your body of work um, is enough. Um, but I did feel like over the course of my career, I probably didn't get a lot of the recognition that I, I thought I may have deserved uh, for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, that kept me humble. I, I knew what was important for me is that I always earned the respect of my teammates, and that made the difference for me and always earning the respect of my opponent. Like I, I wanted to wa- walk away from each game having my opponent feel like, man, that was a battle. Mm-hmm. And um, I knew that was important for me. But, you know, the accolades and, you know, and the number of awards and things like that, you you often think about if that, if that merits a Hall of Fame a career. Um, and so, you know, over time, people started to talk about it, that I deserved that. And, then, you know, I, I did want that. I'm not going to lie. You know, I felt like, you know, I was – I kind of always been the underdog because I probably wasn't the most um, boisterous guy. Uh, yeah, you weren't. You know, you would but, get a sack and be like <laughs> – like, Jump up and Everybody else is click. like, you know, doing all these <laughs> yeah, dances the, and you're like, the grave, yeah. The grave digger. Mm. Yeah, no – yeah, the sack. Yeah, you ain't had no signature move. It was yeah, I, did, like, I didn't. I just, I just did what, whatever was great in the moment. Nine and a half sacks, baby. And um, yeah, you I had a uh, what like about seventy nine more than I had. <laughs> <laughs> Man, nobody counting. I was counting. I was counting. <laughs> <laughs> One <laughs> for this season. <laughs> Point five. For this one, yeah, life of a nose guard, man. We He's got a run stopper, heroes. though. That yeah, could, that when could you get penciled in at a run stopper, boy, it's it's hard. It's tough sledding, man. <laughs> it is tough sledding, man. They third down, get him out of there. <laughs> I'm waiting. I'm like, coach, he's tired. Second and, second and long. He tired. Look at him. You run out there. No, no, I can't. Yeah. That you know what that happened to me. I think. I remember a game we played, it was in Miami, and I was watching the film, and I didn't remember why I got taken out on third down. 
the opening drive of the game on Monday Night Football, they got the first two sacks against Dan Marino. Mm -hmm. And third down, they took me out. But we had a rush package, and so we're. And then I think I was you coming. You were part of the package. I was, yeah, but I, I don't know. I think it was a way to not give me as much reps because I, had, I was kind of hurt that game, and coming off an of ankle injury. So two sacks, to, man. You playing the, the whole rest. I'm never yeah, taking you but, out. Yeah, and, and I wanted to get that third down rep so bad, and I got taken off. The you field. ever got three sacks in the game? I have had several games where I had three sacks. Oh, more than yeah. one. God, well. Yeah. I guess that's why you're in the Hall of Fame. I guess. Yeah. I was just, I lucky to get another half after my sack, man. I had to get like, I had to get them like first down sacks or something like that because I already knew third down. It was going to be like, brr, brr, get him out of there. Get out. Get him out of there. Were you always just like diesel? I was always a Because like, kid. You're, you're, like it, your fingers are like strong, <laughs> dog. Like, just like, this your pincer grasp <laughs> is pretty strong. The pincer grasp, the, yeah. This right here is strong. And then, like on an insect, the pincer, dog, oh, the crab, them things <laughs> get off my fingers. <laughs> that hands is strong, bro. You got them old, like them old, like yeah. You know, your dad worked at four, right? Yeah. Like you got them assembly line type. You know, I, I think I think a big part of the game, this is what I tell my son, too, and all the guys that I coach, I even gifted. Shout out to Bryce, man. Yeah. Notre Dame, I even baby. gifted uh, my D lineman, like, hand grip strength uh, no, exercises. I, never got that. You like, didn't I get gave him, like, you didn't get that balls. And, you didn't get that to me. Well, this is when I started coaching because oh. I realized how important it was. But Johnny Parker, shout out to Johnny Parker, who used to Say make us now. do the, you know, the hand grip, grip exercises. Say that now. But your grip is so important, man. I always felt like if I can get my hands on the guy and oh, hold him, like cancel Christmas. Yeah, like that's so so important. So hand grip all, strength. Man, is all y'all was like that though, man. Deese, Stone, Newberry is like, man. Once you once he get his hands on you, yeah. you might as well wait for the next play. <laughs> <laughs> like that one year we went to Mexico, and we I think we beat uh, Arizona. Um, I remember that. It was yeah. high. The altitude was like 8,000. Remember, coaches like just run back and forth, like do a half gasser. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and then start the game. <laughs> you start man, the game, blew out. It was it was wild, man. But we had some good times, though, man. And I uh, I really appreciate you, man, uh, taking me under your wing because I, I wouldn't have been a good Chicago Bear if it, if it wasn't for you, like showing me how to take on the double teams and, and – you know, just how to be a professional. It was it was noticeable because I talked to Tommy Harris, mm. and uh, he was like, when he saw you at the Pro Bowl, he was like, this dude is a man. He was like, B-Y. I had this conversation with him the other day, man. He was like, dude. He was like, man, if you see him down there, man, tell him I said what's up. Tommy, man. Was, Tommy like, was a good player, man. Yeah, yeah, man. But you know what? You you were you were good, man. You were a great. Uh, <laughs> You're just a sponge. You took it all in, and you're willing to learn and do whatever it took to to win. And uh, I, I just love being teammates with you, man. Such a good dude. Uh, likewise, uh, man. Lighthearted, but can be serious at times. At you see, lighthearted, but can be serious at times. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the great teammate uh, took his craft serious. Uh, but but um, just a joy to, to play with, man. So what is it like? Because I, I remember meeting Kai when she was like, I think she was like two or something, or two or three. And she was like a baby. And now, you know, you see her playing volleyball. Like, you know, your kids is like getting scholarships and yeah. playing ball and stuff. Like, what's what's that like now? You know, it's, it's great to be able to see your kid excel at whatever it is, whether it's academic, uh, being a student athlete, playing whatever sport, you know, but just being a support to our kids. Um, my daughter played volleyball and you know she liked it. And obviously I didn't play and I didn't know how to, to coach her in that. So it was obviously hers and she had to make it her own and take the responsibility um, however far she wanted to go with it. Mm -hmm. And so, but to be an encouragement and support for each of our kids wherever they were is has been important. Um, 
and everybody, you know, everybody's different. Yeah. And so just knowing who who's who and who likes what and who doesn't like what. My God. Well, look, hey man, I appreciate your time, man. Uh, I just want to give you your flowers right now, man, and just thank you for everything, man. Everything you've done for me, my family. I appreciate you, uh, 49ers. Y'all got the right person and y'all ring of honor. Um, BY is the greatest I've I've ever seen, like professional, like on and off the field. Stop it. Uh, I ain't just saying that because you're here, man. Like <laughs> I say, I'm gonna give you these flowers. Uh, this guy is the, the, the best individual. It, he was in my wedding. BY was in my wedding, man. And um, you know, I, I appreciate you always being there for me, man. All the words of encouragement. All the advice, everything, man. Just a first class individual. I, I was the old. I was the only old head there at your wedding. <laughs> why is this, no, why is this old? Dude? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I had to be there, man. I had to witness a happy union. Uh, two lovely. Oh man, you saw everything, man. Two I lovely, came in, yeah. Like you, you know? were, like the whole. You know, before you even got engaged, dating your girl, like who is this AC girl? <laughs> who is this AC girl? And I got a chance to meet AC, and and you guys just you just were a great couple from the get. Yeah, um, man. And I had we to learned witness, from the best, man. Had to witness a happy union. Yeah, man. I yeah, appreciate you, man. Thank you. Appreciate your time. you, brother.